All righty. So we'll con <clears throat> uh, sorry, we'll continue um and finish ten point two today. Uh, test review tomorrow. If you haven't had the opportunity to attempt that, please do so. Let me move that out of the way and get rid of the video and we'll dive right in. Uh, for online students who've ever wondered, I have to get rid of the video because of where the camera is. It creates this infinite mirror effect where Zoom is recording itself if I don't uh, kill the video. So let's talk today about, well, a few things. This chapter is kind of a grab bag. But first about geometric series. So geometric series are series of the form going from one to infinity of some number a times r to the power of n minus one. And what this minus one does, it causes the terms to start with a. And that's because r to the zero is always one. So we start with a, and then the next term has an r, and the next term after that has an r squared, the next term after that has a, oops, has an r cubed, then an r to the fourth, and so on. So this is a very sort of famous series. I mean, it has a name, which is quite unusual. Um, sometimes we teach uh, children about geometric series for, for sort of obscure reasons, in my opinion. But um, a geometric series can converge or it can diverge, depending on what R is. And if it converges, we know what it converges to. And that's a really special result. Because for most series, even if we know they converge, there's no good way other than just going to Wolfram Alpha and looking at partial sums to know what they converge to. <laughs> Geometric series are the exceptions to this. They converge if and only if the absolute value of R is strictly less than one. And if the absolute value of R is strictly less than one, they converge to A divided by one minus R. So for example, the sum from one to infinity of three times two thirds to the n minus one or k minus one, it doesn't matter. Sometimes we write under the semand sign what we're calling our, our index. But here, this is a geometric series, starts with three, then has three times two thirds. 
then has three times two thirds squared and so on. So answering questions about convergence here is pretty straightforward. Two thirds is less than one. So it converges and it converges to three over one minus two thirds, which we can mess around with that a little and find that it's equal to not three. The day for little mistakes, maybe it converges to nothing. Um, we can make a pretty straightforward argument about why this is true. Although I call it straightforward, it's not an obvious argument. I mean, it isn't something that I would expect a student to just figure out. But once we see somebody else do it, here's how it goes. The nth partial sum is a plus ar plus ar squared plus ar cubed up to a r n minus one. And then this trick that somebody um, came up with is to multiply the nth partial sum by r. And there's nothing stopping you from um, doing that. The nth partial sum is just a polynomial. It's a usual finite algebraic expression. And when we multiply a polynomial by a constant, all the terms in the polynomial are going to be multiplied by the constant. And what this is mostly going to do is just move everything to the right. So when we multiply a by r, we get a times r. When we multiply a r by r, we get a r squared. A r squared by r gives a r cubed and so on. And then we get one term that we didn't have before. When we multiply a times r to the n minus one by r, it becomes a r to the n. And now we subtract s sub n minus r s sub n. On the right, almost everything just goes away. I mean, we get this A and way over here, a zero minus A R to the N gives minus A R to the N. And that's all we have. I mean, if you look at the R squares, for example, when you subtract, they just cancel out and go away. So the only terms that make it are the A and that A R to the N. Then we do some algebra.
And this is what we wind up with for the nth partial sum. And the limit of the series is the um is the limit of the nth partial sum. The limit as n goes to infinity of a times one minus r to the n over one minus r. And now let's just look at what happens the one minus r to the n. And hmm, maybe the easiest way to look at this is to just drag out Desmos. Let's see. So y equals one minus r to the power of n. Okay, it doesn't like to the power of n, we'll say to the power of x, and we'll add a slider. And let's try to adjust this slider a little. Let's let it go from zero to two in kind of small intervals. You see the instant we let R be greater than one, zoomed in the wrong direction there. The instant we let R be greater than one, one minus R to the N goes right off to negative infinity. So this limit goes to either negative infinity or positive infinity. And R is greater than one. As N goes to infinity, one minus R to the N goes to negative infinity. And a number A times negative infinity divided by one minus a number R is negative infinity. So if um, n goes to infinity, this whole fraction goes to infinity. On the other hand, if default that viewing window, if r is less than one, then what happens as we go to infinity is that we have a horizontal asymptote at one. So if R is less than one, then one minus R converges to one and we wind up with a limit of A over one minus R, which is precisely what I said that the sum would be. So geometric series have some kind of cute applications. I'll give one of them. Um, in fact, before I talk <laughs> about series or geometric series specifically, let's talk about infinite series. 
as they show up in a very sort of common application that we teach to children, the application of decimals. So remember how numbers work. This might be kind of rudimentary for a calculus class, but if you have 147, You've got a hundreds place and a tens place and a ones place. And 147 says you have one one hundred and four tens and seven ones. So 147 is a sum. or you can think of it as a sum. It's however many hundreds we have, plus however many tens we have, plus however many ones we have. If you now write down a decimal, well, again, we have a tens place, we have a ones place, we have a one tenth space. We have a one one hundredth space. So one, ten, and seven ones, and one one tenth, and three one one hundredths. So we teach young children, or relatively young children anyway, that you can have a decimal that doesn't terminate. You can have, you know, 0 0.3141, and I forget the rest, but you can have pi, a decimal that doesn't terminate. Don't quote me on that fourth decimal place. I think it's 3141, 314 something. But anyway, the fact that this decimal doesn't terminate tells you that pi is a series. We've got a three in the tenth space, and we've got a one in the 100th place, and we've got a four in the 1,000th one place, and we've got a one, I think, in the 1,10,000th place. And because the decimal doesn't terminate, this sum goes on forever, and an infinite sum is an infinite series. Is. <laughs> Let's look at another kind of infinite decimal. The repeating infinite decimal. Where the same terms the same pattern just repeats forever. And it's a result that you may remember that every repeating decimal is a fraction and be written as a integer divided by an integer. In fact, any repeating decimal is a geometric series. So this seven, this, um, it starts repeating in the hundreds column, which is why we have 17 over 100 as our first decimal. Then it repeats again 
in the um, four zeros in the 10,000 spot. So 17 over 10,000 is our next summand. And then it repeats again in the six zeros. So in the millionth spot. And this is 17 over 100 plus 17 over 100 times 1 over 100 plus 17 one hundredths times 1 over 100 squared plus and so on, because it repeats every two decimal places. Um, we're moving twice to the right at every step. And to move twice to the right, we multiply by one one hundredth. And once you rewrite a repeating decimal as a geometric series, I've made the comment that every repeating decimal can be written as a fraction. I think that's something that most of us learn how to do at one point in our life and then probably just kind of forget. But one way to write a repeated decimal as a fraction is to use the geometric series form to the, this equals A divided by one minus R, so 17 over 100, over 99, over 100. Seventeen over 99. Let's, uh, let's do another example of this real quick. So, Zero point nine repeating equals one. Um, this is something that's probably all of us are taught at one point. It's um, a source of great drama among math cranks. Um, like if you go to the Wikipedia talk page, you can find hundreds of hundreds of comments of random people declaring that this can't possibly be true and they have decided that it's just a number that's almost one, but a little less than one. Um, there's really nothing you can do with those people other than to tell them that if they've really revolutionized mathematics, they should write it up and try to get it published. But hopefully no one in the room um, is going to feel that way. And geometric series provide us a way of seeing this. So we've got a nine in the tenths place, and we've got a nine 
in the hundreds place, and we've got a nine in the thousands place. This is geometric. It starts with nine tenths, and then all of the terms after it are multiplied by a tenth. So to go from nine tenths to nine hundreds, you multiply by a tenth. To go from nine hundreds to nine thousands, thousandths. You multiply by a tenth. To go from nine thousandths to nine ten thousandths, you multiply by a tenth and so on. So, I mean, I was probably, you know, years of sort of frustration with these people has probably caused me to be a little uncharitable. I mean, you could maybe, def I mean, you could use like, it might be possible to define a coherent system of math where point 0.9 repeating is something other than one. But in order for point 0.9 repeating not to equal one, you really have to just reject the limits. And by rejecting limits, you pretty much have to reject all of calculus. So if you're really determined that point 0.9 repeating ought to be something other than one, I hope you're getting something out of that, something so valuable that it's worth just dismissing the entire field of calculus. And somehow I think most of the people who go to Wikipedia and fight about this are not going to revolutionize mathematics. It's just... Uh, punch I have. Um, so the remainder of this section is sort of a hodgepodge of results. Um, does anybody have questions about geometric series? Then I'm not going to dwell on telescoping series. Um, I'll just, well, hopefully spend about 10 minutes on it. Telescoping series are series where almost all terms in the partial sums collapse. And this isn't a formal definition. It's a you know it when you see it kind of thing. Um, and it's a pretty artificial situation, frankly, which is why I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this. But something like The sum from one to infinity of one over n 
minus one over n plus one. So what they're going to see here, if you look at the partial sums, So the first partial sum, the sum from one to one, we just stick one in there. The second partial sum, we stick one and two in there. When we stick one in there, we get that. When we stick two, in there, we get this. And notice that in this partial sum, we have a minus one half and a plus one half. So those cancel. We stick three, the third partial sum. So we stick one in there, we stick two in there, we stick three in there, And we notice once again that these terms collapse, that these uh, positives and minuses cancel each other out and go away. The general pattern, S sub one is one minus one half, S sub two is one minus one third. S sub three is one minus one fourth. S sub n. Is one minus one over n plus one. And the limit as n goes to infinity of S sub n is using somewhat informal notation, but one minus one over infinity or one minus zero, which is one. So Again, a kind of artificial situation. Most series aren't telescoping. Um, the name, I don't know how popular these are in as like gifts to children in today's age, but A little portal, portable wood telescope would be structured like this. And it's designed so that you can collapse it together. It's designed so that this piece here can fit into that piece there, and this big piece here can fit into that piece there. So when you collapse the telescope, you just have the smallest bit at the beginning and the longest bit at the end. So that's the, uh, that's the imagery we have that uh, motivated the name. And now a few theorems. And some of these theorems are quite important. I hope they're mainly going to also be pretty, uh, pretty natural. This isn't like, like how to this one where we had the mean value theorem and it was sort of complicated looking. Um, 
theorem. So a sum from one to infinity converges or diverges with the sum from K goes from to, from a capital M to infinity of A sub N. Now, the phrase converges or diverges with is making this sound much more complicated than it actually is. What this is saying is really is that you can't spell, you can delete the first few terms in a series and it doesn't change whether or not the series converges or diverges. And this is more useful than it probably sounds. Um, during the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at tests for determining whether series converge or diverge. And a lot of those tests have conditions attached to them. You can only use this test in such and such situation. So a very common requirement for these tests is that they only work with positive series. So maybe you have, I don't know, negative one-fifth plus negative one-fourth. Obviously, plus a minus is kind of ugly notation, but let it be. I'll skip one over zero for obvious reasons. And here's your infinite series. So we start with negative one fifth. And then we just keep bumping the denominator up, except that we're skipping zero because we can't divide by zero. And we have a test we want to use, the, uh, the integral test. And this test will tell us whether this series converges or diverges, except that we can't use it because the integral test requires that all of your terms be positive. Well, what this theorem on the previous frame says is, well, you can just cross off the first few terms of the series and it won't change whether it's converging or not. And now we've got the series of all positive terms and we can use the integral test. So it's a way of getting rid of troublesome entries of a series. If you just have one or two or a finite number of them. Let's see. Um, so because of this result, 
when we're talking about convergence or divergence, I often get kind of sloppy and I'll write something like this. And I ask, you know, I ask whether this converges or diverges, and I'm not bothering to tell you, are we starting at one or five or seven or a thousand? Because it doesn't matter where we start. In fact, what you often see when textbooks and people want to be really lazy is you see this notation for infinite series. If you just see a sigma, no starting point, no terminal point, you assume you're looking at an infinite sum. Let me see. Constant multiples, don't change convergence or divergence. So if we've got this infinite sum and this infinite sum, they either both converge or they both diverge. And those are the main results, the, what I think are the most important results in the section. I'm just throwing a few kind of stragglers on the board. If this series converges, and this series converges, then this series converges, and it converges to the natural thing. If an goes to a and bn goes to b, then an plus bn goes to a plus b. Um, in general, you want to be really careful um, with results like this. And you should assume that if I haven't given you a result, it's because the result probably isn't true. Like there's there's probably a temptation to think that if a n diverges and b n diverges. Then a n plus b n also diverges, question mark. And I mean, the logic you're using is that if a is going to infinity and b is going to infinity and you add them together, it should still be going to infinity. Except that this is a false statement. One a series where we add one to itself an infinite number of times diverges. And the series where we add negative one to itself an infinite number of times diverges. But you put these together and you get 
a series that converges. So you have to be really careful. And I mean, this is just good advice in general when you're working with infinity is not to assume that your intuition you have from working with finite numbers is going to carry over. I mean, we already saw Grandi's series where you can put parentheses in a sum and change what it adds up to seemingly. That's something that you can't do with finite sums, but your intuition breaks down when you're looking at infinite sums. So you should sort of be careful in general, but, but this is a true statement and it's an important statement, I guess. I guess if I wanted to be excruciating the correct, I should put the condition that k isn't zero there, because zero times a divergent series will converge. But, but that's silly. Why would you be multiplying by zero? And that's that. There's, um, in spite of the test next week, I think you should find the time to do the 10.2 homework assignment. There is just one assignment for this week. Um, so we'll look tomorrow. I mentioned this in, in, in Canvas, but not in person, that what I did last semester was um, give in the class and take home portions of the test. So I'll do that again this semester.